Hello everybody, my name is Graham Walker. I am an emergency physician in San Francisco and I wanted to make this guide. I've seen a lot of people on EM Docs bitching about how confusing this thing is, uh, which is happening tomorrow. Um, and it is gross outside, so I thought I would just make a quick video for all of my emergency medicine colleagues. Uh, this is not, it's not gonna be difficult. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it just is gonna take some time to get used to, just like everything in life. So um, I've spent a, a bunch of time doing this for my medical group, um, but I thought I would make a video that is um, available to and applicable to everybody that does emergency medicine. Uh, so, uh, it says HR. Uh, so that's me, Graham Walker. Uh, thank you for watching. Hopefully I, uh, I'm trying to keep this like 15-ish minutes, but I'll try to go into the appropriate amount of detail um, that I think you may need. Uh, so the first thing I'll say is, if your EHR has a tool, you should just use that. Uh, you can certainly learn from this video and I still think it'll be helpful, but I know Epic has a tool. Um, I would highly recommend you use it if you have it. Uh, if you have Epic, it's great. I really like it. I think Epic did a really good job um, building it uh, in a very short period of time. Uh, I don't know about the other EHRs, sorry. If you have Epic and you don't know anything about this Epic tool, uh, your CMIO is in trouble. You should contact your CMIO because this has been available uh, for the past month or so from Epic and uh, you're, you should have been educated about this, sorry. Uh, I'll give a quick overview of the changes and then I'll give a little disclaimer and then we'll, we'll dive in. Uh, okay, so um, I'm just reading from my notes. So. 28 years ago, CMS and Medicare and CPT and the AMA, everybody updated our billing guidelines. And those are the ones we've been using for almost 30 years now. It's the 10 part review of systems, level four, level five, all that other um, garbage, because uh, I, I think they're really pretty crappy. Um, and we finally are getting an update tomorrow, January 1st, 2023. Um, I will say that the outpatient billing guidelines were updated about two years ago, so that th we're kind of next in the, the process to review and update uh, billing guidelines. So the big change here is everything is entirely based on your medical decision making. Other than that, it, for billing purposes, it does not matter what you document in your note. And we'll go over the specifics of what that means in terms of medical decision making. But essentially what that means is you don't have any requirements now for what you put in the HPI, the physical exam. People could care less if you do a review of systems from a billing perspective. Um, no more family history, social history requirements, none of that. Uh, that's, that's all gone starting tomorrow. Obviously, uh, you need to do any other medical, legal, or regulatory, or like your hospital bylaws, whatever the policies are that um, are for your ER, whatever needs to go in your note still needs to go in your note, but additional garbage doesn't need to be in your note for billing purposes anymore. Uh, you can put, you know, you should still be doing a review of systems when talking with the patient, but you don't have to fill out a 10 point review of systems. You can just include your relevant or pertinent review of systems in your HPI like you're probably already doing. Um, and then obviously you want to document why you're doing things you're thinking, why you're, uh, what your differential is, obviously, to some degree. You know, if you're documenting an ankle fracture, you probably should be documenting pulses and a full ankle exam. No surprise there. Um, yeah, so uh, the other point is that the codes themselves have not changed. So it's still 99285, 84, 83, et cetera. The one change is there is no more level one that is gone. Uh, the guidelines essentially say, Level one is something so basic an ER doctor should not even be seeing it in the ER. It should make its way into the ER. So everything is a level two and up from now on. Um, and then the last thing is procedures are still separate. Critical care time is still separate. So you're still gonna, um, those will still be billed as, as like those separate codes. Okay, uh, that's the quick and dirty overview. Um, my disclaimer, since this is a medical video um, on billing, I am just a random ER doctor. I have spent probably 20 or 30 hours like mulling through this in my head, reading the guidelines several times. Rob Orman has a great podcast on it as well. Uh, but I've tried to understand this to teach it to my colleagues in my institution. Um, this is my best job, my best interpretation at this stuff. But uh, your interpretation or your hospitals might be different or your coders or whatever. And I will just preface and warn you 
uh, the, the tool I'm about to show you is verbatim from this, um, this tool here that I'll, I'll reference occasionally. This is the actual guidelines. Uh, if you want to Google this, you can find this PDF um, on the AMA website, I think. Um, but I, I will just warn you, the, the language is so vague and obtuse and um, uh, painful because this rubric that I'm gonna show you is meant to also apply to outpatient billing as well. So that's why you're gonna see all this gar all these garbage terms that don't mean much to you as an ER doctor, and I'll try to cover that. Um, but that's why this stuff is, uh, it's gonna sound vague, and it's gonna be like, this doesn't really make sense for an ER billing scheme. I get it. Uh, it's meant to try to be all encompassing for everyone in medicine, which I know that um, sounds stupid, but that's what they chose to do. Uh, okay, so getting into the nitty gritty here, take a deep breath. A lot of people online are like, uh, on the Facebook EM Docs group are freaking out that this is difficult and it's worse and it's government regulation. This is like, I think so much better. I think your notes are gonna be like half as long if you want them to be, um, and it's not hard. Uh, you do algorithms like this in your head, you see the chief complaint and their age, skim their past medical history, and you already have an algorithm of the things you're probably gonna end up doing for this person. So you can do this, it's okay. Um, you literally manage emergencies for a living. And then I, I truly think this is gonna be better, so much better overall than clicking 10 point review systems and all that other um, garbage. Okay, let's dive in. This is the grid. Um, this is kind of taken verbatim. I just kind of cleaned up the language to make it try to fit on one page. And I'll, you can find online things that are similar to this. Um, uh, and I, I modified a couple versions, different versions that I put together and found. Uh, yeah. So let's just go over the general overview here. Um, again, on this left side, you will still see those same codes. So that doesn't change. And then you'll see these three different columns and that's how this information in medical decision making is broken down. Um, you're gonna get points or you're gonna have to assign like a level uh, to pr the problem or the problems um, or the potential problems like in your differential. You're going to assign points or evaluate for complexity or amount of data reviewed. Um, and I'll warn you, this is the most obnoxious and annoying of the columns. Uh, so we'll do that one last. And then risk. Excuse me, this is meant to totally be clinician level risk. If you're signing out a patient and say like, yeah, I think this person's high risk of blah, that counts. Uh, this is truly meant to be the way that you and I speak about risk um, every day for a patient. Great. So essentially the way this is gonna work um, is uh, you're gonna, assign these points or these categories, and then your two highest categories of the three are how you are how you build that level. So if I have their minimal risk, but for some reason I, um, I do moderate amount of data review on them and, um, uh, and a low amount of complexity, uh, uh, it's gonna be a level um, two, uh, because they're, uh, sorry, I had to think about that for a second. So it's gonna be a level two because you're, if you meet this third category, you definitely meet the, the second category. Um, and again, most of the time, this stuff is gonna correlate pretty well. If they're high risk, if it's a concerning problem, you're probably gonna be doing more tests and workup. So it's gonna make more sense. Okay, uh, these terms are just straightforward, low, moderate, high are kind of the categories um, here. And then I'll, uh, I'll go through uh, these specifics in a little more detail. So I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, uh, okay, let's start. Let's just go ahead and start with problem here. So this is number and complexity of problems addressed, and this is uh, this is really meant to be like the things that the patient is there for that they want addressed during their visit. So if they have, you know, if they're that patient that says like, oh, I have a sore throat and my ankle, and I sprained my ankle, and they wanna be evaluated for those two things. Those are two separate complaints, but obviously if they're there for vomiting and diarrhea and abdominal pain, that is one general problem, unless you can somehow put together the sore throat and the ankle sprain. Uh, okay, um, minimal uh, is gonna be extremely rare. This truly is like, 
The best I've thought about it is like a bug bite. It truly is self-limited. Oh, they, I have this thing. It's going to go away with you doing nothing to it. Um, and it is, it's truly that minimal. Most things are going to at least be a low. Uh, and, and I'll give you some examples here. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is this term stable. This has nothing to do with the patient's clinical stability, hemodynamic stability. This is if the this is like a total problem-based um, approach. So this is uh, is the patient's medical problem stable, meaning it's fully optimized, right? So if they have chronic low back pain and they're there for an exacerbation of their low back pain, that is not a stable problem because it's not maximally op optimized or it's, it's, it has an exacerbation right now. If they are there for um, their, their blood pressure being high uh, and the goal, the goal of their blood pressure management is for it to not be high, that is a, an exacerbation of a, um, a problem or a, uh, a problem that is not stable. So if you see this stable term under problems, it is not clinical hemodynamic stability the way you and I use it um, as stable. It is if the problem is kind of optimally managed for their goals of care, whatever, right? If they are on hospice, their goals of care for a problem is gonna be different than somebody else, obviously. Okay, so that's stable. So again, a stable chronic illness, um, maybe like hypertension or you know low back pain, or maybe they have an acute uncomplicated illness or injury they injured their ankle. Uh, maybe they have a stable acute illness, um, or maybe they have um, something that is acute and it's not that complicated, but they need, they need inpatient or OBS care for whatever reason. I'll let you come up with the example. Um, they have pylo and they are clinically not that sick, but they just can't stop vomiting, whatever. Uh, so you need to admit them for nausea medicine. Um, moderate, uh, again, just going up in complexity here, um, they have an exacerbation of their chronic illness or a side effect. So say they're on something for their lupus and they have a side effect from their steroids or whatever, that would that could be an exacerbation. Um, obviously something like a COPD exacerbation makes a lot of sense. The, I highlighted this one here in blue um, for undiagnosed new problem with uncertain prognosis. Um, and I'll just, just to, to prove this to you guys, uh, this is a problem in your differential that uh, represents a condition likely to result in a high risk of morbidity. So I highlighted that one because obviously this is a lot of what we do. We see a lot of chest pain. Most of it is not ACS, but if it's truly in your differential that this could be ACS, this person is at least a moderate in their problem um, statement. You know, if somebody, an old person falls and bonks their head and you, you know, intracranial hemorrhage is on your differential and you're scanning them for that reason, uh, that counts. Um, and then rounding out moderate is an acute illness with systemic symptoms. Now uh, they say like if they had COVID or the flu and they have just kind of body aches and fevers and stuff like that, um, that should really count as, as more like an ac acute uncomplicated illness. Um, not necessarily like a uh, you know a systemic symptoms thing, but if you're you know, if you're worried that part of that is that they're you know septic or something, um, uh, you know I, I think really the goal of this is to give you the clinician, the educated, licensed professional, um, more leeway in your ability to determine what is what does systemic symptoms mean, and it, maybe in some way it's intentionally vague for you to interpret it the way you want. Um, and then one complicated injury, uh, complicated usually means that there's, um, uh, your, uh, includes uh, evaluation of the body systems that are not directly part of the injured organ, or it's extensive, or there are multiple treatment options. Again, extensive. It's vague on purpose, so you can make a decision yourself. And then high, this is obviously um, trying to correlate well with like a level five visit uh, in the current guidelines, the 2022 20, and, and before guidelines. So a chronic illness with a severe exacerbation um, or an acute um, or chronic illness that poses a, a threat to life or body. The, the other point I will I will make is, you know, everyone I've, I've, I've talked to has recommended that obviously you're documenting what you're going to assign this code. So, um, you know, if somebody, um, uh, you know, if somebody has appendicitis, for example, I don't know that you necessarily need to type out that their appendicitis poses a threat to life or body function in their in your documentation. 
but I think you do want to include something that implies some degree of that. Um, appendicitis, consulting surgery for operative management or for admission of the hospital, uh, I think that uh, should should probably be sufficient. But again, this is just my my interpretation. It's not any coders people I've talked to. I'm sure um, people will have different opinions on this. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip this complexity of data because it sucks, uh, and we'll do it last. Risk of complications. I think in some ways this is the easiest one for, for us because, like I said, this is truly meant to be uh, the way that you and I talk about risk. Is this person moderate risk of this, low risk? Um, and again, it's vague so that you can interpret it the way that you think is appropriate. Uh, the, the biggest key point here is that these are examples only. These are taken directly from this PDF here. Um, and, and, you know, the PDF has their own little table, like much worse formatted. Um, but the PDF has its own table here. And these are just examples only. Again, these are meant to apply to outpatient as well. That's why you're seeing some of these these things that um, that don't make a whole ton of sense uh, in this in this in the ER world. Um, so prescription drug management that just means that you're either adding or removing or modifying one of the prescription drugs that they will take as an outpatient. Uh, you get to define what minor or major surgery is um, or a minor or major procedure, uh, but you know I think within reason, obviously. And then the, the other thing I do want to call out here is if your patient's diagnosis or treatment plan or how complex it's going to be is determined or limited or changed based on social determinants of health, they're homeless, they're uninsured, they're underinsured and they can't get access to their doctor, they are poor and they don't have a car, or they can't afford their prescription, um, they don't speak English as their first language and there's some challenges with um, explaining everything to them or them understanding everything. That counts. Uh, that's going to increase their potential morbidity or their risk, um, hopefully not their mortality, uh, and that, that counts as well. So I, I think that's nice that that's called out, especially with us working in the ER, seeing a number of people with um, uh, social determinants of health impacting their, their lives. And then uh, under high risk here, again, examples only, uh, drug therapy, mon you know, intensive monitoring for toxicity. So again, if you're putting somebody on Coumadin, say you're an outpatient cardiologist, you're putting somebody on Coumadin um, and they need to have their drugs, mon their levels monitored, that's going to count for outpatient. Probably doesn't apply a ton to us um, in the ER, but um, just something to consider. And then decision regarding um, surgery. Notice you're seeing this word decision a lot. And the other thing that's really nice, I think, about these guidelines is that in, it includes the patient's goals of care and shared decision making. So if you are considering doing these tests or considering hospitalizing somebody, but it's not really within their goals of care, or that it's, it's not their preference, um, uh, that, that counts just as much. Um, if you were thinking about hospitalizing them or you guys had a discussion about it, they're kind of tenuous um, and they opted to go home, you maybe don't totally love that idea, but that's what they've chosen. Um, and you, but you, you know, uh, that's, that's going to count as high risk as well. Uh, let me just see if I have any other notes here before I go into the, the data section because it, it just, God, it sucks. Um, okay. Oh, I guess the, the last thing I'll say is this, this data says, uh, this does say the risk is based on, um, uh, based on the consequences, consequences. So here's the low risk category. So it's the, obviously the risk of morbidity or mortality or complications. And then the risk is, um, uh, you know, they give a couple examples. A low probability of death may be high risk in a particular condition um, or a particular scenario, whereas a high chance of a minor self-limited adverse event may be low risk. So again, it's totally clinical risk. Definitions are based on the usual behavior and thought processes of a trained physician. Trained clinicians apply this language commonly. And then the piece I wanted to say here is um, um, risk is based upon the consequences of the problem addressed at the encounter when appropriately treated. And it also includes the need to initiate or forego further testing, treatment, or hospitalization. So again, this truly is meant to be, I mean, I love this. It's truly meant to be what the doctor thinks. Okay. I've gone over, but uh, 
Uh, I want to be thorough. So hopefully this is like the only thing you need to watch or pay attention to um, for tomorrow. Okay. Uh, the last column is data. Um, it sucks because it's like um, Russian nesting dolls or a, a, an onion of layers of stuff to peel away. So I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. I highlighted the, the little bits in yellow where the, like the, the amount of stuff changes and it's sequential or um, this is like additive. So as you do more tests or as you meet higher criteria, the, the prior criteria will always already be fulfilled. Okay, so minimal, you don't do any tests and you don't review any data at all. Um, or sorry, any external data. Okay, so the categories get a little confusing here. So you have to do one of this category one or category two. Category two is pretty straightforward. It is an assessment requiring an independent historian. Um, and uh, let me find this. Oh, an independent historian is an individual, a parent, a guardian, a surrogate, a spouse, witness, EMS, a nursing home nurse, um, who provides additional, uh, provides history in addition to a history provided to the patient who is unable to provide a complete or reliable history. So if they passed out, if they have dementia, if they are concussed, if they're altered, um, if they're too young to be able to give you a full history, uh, that, that all counts. Um, and that, that, so just doing that, talking to EMS, um, anything like that, that already gets you to this, this category Two checked off means you're at least in this limited category. If you don't want to do that, um, you can, uh, uh, do a couple different things. So this is going to be more of the review of the data. Um, so you have to do any combination of two of the following. This is a review of prior external notes from a unique source. For the purposes of us in the ER, this is going to be um, notes, tests, documents from essentially from outside of your ER. So if you're reading the primary care doctor's note, if you're reading a cardiologist's note, if you're reading an ER note but from another ER, it, essentially it can't be like an ER doctor in your group. It can't be like they, oh, they, they we saw them yesterday in my ER and, and I'm seeing them again today in my ER. It can't be my same colleague. But if I'm seeing somebody uh, reading a note from SF General or something and I don't work there, that does count. So that's any one note or kind of piece of data. Or if you're ordering or reviewing the results of, of unique tests. Now, when you hear tests, you probably think blood work. The one caveat here, which is why this column is annoying, the caveat is that um, you don't get credit for interpreting a Chem 7 or a CBC or whatever, right? If you don't say that, oh, you don't get points for saying the creatinine is stable or it's up or they're in AKI or something like that. Labs um, and kind of blood tests, and I, I assume urine tests and things like that, are assumed to be part of the order is the analysis or the review of the order when it results. So in the outpatient world, you know, if the CBC comes back tomorrow, um, it, it still counts that it's being, you know, all of that still comes in as one thing. But other things like imaging um, or EKGs or, uh, you know, other stuff, other tests you might order in the ER, those do count as a as a unique thing that you are reviewing. So when it says unique test, so it's, that's essentially the the CPT code for that test. Just think of it as like a a grouper um, for a test. So you're not going to get extra points for getting the white count and the hemoglobin and the crit and the MCV and the RDW and all that stuff. That's one test. Same with a Chem 7, a glucose and a creatinine. All That's all one test. Um, so, and again, this is two. So you could do um, a CBC and a chemistry panel. Uh, so you've ordered two tests. You could do an EKG and a CBC. Uh, that's, oh, you've reviewed if you read the uh, read the EKG yourself and you order a CBC, that's two. Uh, you could do a troponin and review a prior note, that's two. So again, you get two. So if you do two of these, you satisfy this category one, and that, that then you're good for that category. Or you can just 
you take an, you know, include an independent historian. Okay, so that's limited. Moderate. You need one of these three. So, to make it more confusing, in this new category one, it now includes requiring independent historian here. So if you do three of these things, it like has lumped everything into here, lumped all of this stuff into this just one category. So if you do three of these things, you get that, you're, you're done with this category because you've met one of these three categories, or you independently interpret a test. Again, that's mostly gonna be something like an EKG um, or imaging, um, you know, uh, and, I, and most people I've seen have recommended that you say, you know, chest x-ray, my read, no pneumothorax, no infiltrate, no signs of cardiomegaly, whatever. It, just to, to show that it's your independent read as opposed to you're using the radiologist read. I think you can include their read um, or that it's fine if they kind of overrule you, but you independently interpret it. Same with an EKG. EKG, my read, you know, it's not the computer's read. It's not the cardiologist read that are going to read this thing three days later. You are interpreting it, and then you're kind of acting on that, right? Uh, so that you, if you do that, you get you meet this criteria. And then category three, discussion of management or test interpretation, um, and that this is with a um, uh, with a colleague. So let me just find that. Let me just find that bit here. Uh, okay, so dis discussion of management or testing with an external physician. Uh, I think the easiest way to qualify, and the easiest way to think about this is just a consult. Um, or say you're say you're discharging somebody still, right? But you're you you touch base with the PCP or the cardiologist and making sure that they can get outpatient follow up. And again, specifically, this is discussion. So this is not just an FYI page or text message or message in your EHR. It does have to be an actual back and forth um, or like a, um, it does have to be discussion. Uh, so it can't just be, you send the note to the PCP. They, they do need to respond and it needs to be at least a little bit of a back and forth, um, I think. Um, external physician just means um, a physician outside of your specialty. So, you know, you can't, curbside your colleague or ask your colleague something, document that and then make that count. Okay, so you just have to do one of these three. This kind of bigger one uh, that you, you're probably all, already gonna meet with this lower category um, or independent interpretation tests or uh, a consult. Easiest way to think about it. And then finally here, extensive is two of these three categories same same categories above. So if you do in, you do an EKG and you consult the hospitalist, counts. If you do um, uh, three blood tests and you order an EKG and interpret it yourself, counts. Uh, you review one external note and order two blood tests. Talk to a colleague or talk to a you know a cardiologist, urologist, whatever counts. Hopefully that that makes sense. Um, and I think that should round us out. Uh, there was one other thing I was going to say. Um, oh yeah, so you can find the definitions if you really want to dig in here. You can find the definitions here um, and review these yourselves. This does go into details about all um, all the all the definitions here. I guess the the last thing I'll say is you know if you if you as you're starting to play with this. And as we're all going to learn, I think this is going to come become a pretty second nature to us pretty quickly. And you're going to realize um, that the the codes are probably going to be pretty similar between what you would consider a level five previously and what the um, what the the new criteria are going to be. Because you know, imagine it's like an old person with chest pain. Well, you're going to be reading their EKG yourself. You're gonna be ordering some blood tests on yourself that already gets you to a level, um, a moderate level, uh, or if you you know do, an, do sufficient blood tests and you interpret their EKG, well, you've already hit a level five for, uh, for this criteria for data. Uh, if ACS is in the, your differential, it's at least a level, uh, a moderate here. Um, and arguably somebody that's, you know, an, like an elderly person that uh, that may have ACS, 
um, is certainly a high risk person um, in my book and you know may need further testing or, or whatever. So that's usually going to be a, you know level four, level five. Uh, if you if we just do like an ankle sprain, um, uh, you know, and it looks pretty pretty minimal, um, but you're going to get an X-ray. That's an acute, uncomplicated injury. Uh, you're going to um, independently interpret their test here. Uh, so that's a that's a level moderate. And then depending on you know maybe you discharge them on some ibuprofen. Um, that's going to be you know a four. Or if you you know, just tell them to use an ice pack or something, um, or don't change their kind of prescription drugs. Maybe it's a level three. Uh, again, a level two is going to be pretty rare. It's like a bug bite because if you think of bug, if you think of like bug bite, um, you're not going to do any tests. But if you think of something, I mean, even something as a small little laceration, well, that's an acute, uncomplicated injury. Um, you're probably going to have looked at their um, their notes, and they're probably low risk. Maybe they're minimal risk. Um, so again, it's going to be like a level two or level level three plus uh, you know a laceration note, uh, laceration bill or whatever. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, let me know if you have questions in the. I'm, I think I'm going to post this on YouTube. I, I, I don't know, um, and I'll, I'll try to post this. I'll make this into a PDF maybe and post it as well. I'm going to put this on EM Docs, but feel free to share it. I uh, just thought I would try to help people since I've spent a bunch of time on this. Try to help. Other people in the field of emergency medicine, take care, everybody. Uh, have a happy 2023, and uh, talk to you later. Bye.